All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, the rise of digital technology has made it easier for cyber criminals to carry out their activities, and Nigeria has not been immune to this trend. One of the most common forms of cyber fraud in Nigeria is email phishing scam. These scams typically involve sending fraudulent emails that appear to come from trusted sources, such as banks or government agencies, and these emails usually contain links to fake sites uh, websites that look legit but are designed to steal personal information such as username, passwords, and credit card details. One thing is for certain, for those who fall victim, it is never a good experience. Cyber fraud is a significant issue in Nigeria, with the country being one of the top sources of cyber crime in the world, especially in a time of fast-growing technological advancement and digital society. So today we're asking, um, how can we start to prevent the, and, and protect ourselves from falling victims to cyber fraud? Now, please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 So I'll bring our guest in a second or two. What do you do in terms of protection from, from cyber fraud? Yeah, so um, first things first, I know this past week, let me give you an example. We've, in my office, we've had a lot of spam. I don't know what happened, but we've been getting, and these mails coming like, and because of the kind of business that we run, we expect clients to reach out to us. So the mails literally come like it's a client that's trying to reach out to us with very interesting headings. And then you open it, and we have um, cyber security systems anyway that would detect if, the, if whatever site it is they're trying to link you to is dangerous. So everybody's laptop is literally buzzing every second. And we're like, what is happening? So from Monday, this thing started on Monday. It started from my department, and then we noticed it in the project department, and then the HR, and we're like, what's going on? So I think the IT team in my office now are going to have a meeting this weekend and come back to us on Monday. We're having a training on cyber security on Monday for us to know how to mitigate this. But then I think that um, it has to do with, it has a lot to do with I'll say regulation, I'll say education, technology advancements as well. I think that the three things that I think people need to, you know, put together in order for us to be able to prevent mm. fraud, yeah. Because this fraud issue is going to be something that we're going to be having conversations around it, you know, periodically. Um, thankfully, we have someone that is, you know, an, going to be our in-house <laughs> <laughs> cyber. Um, ex if, they ca if they chop my money, Mustafa, I'm coming for you. <laughs> So Mustafa Yusuf Adebola is a fraud risk consultant and a systems thinker with experience in business consulting, fraud risk management, and advisory. He is a polymath and a philomath, passionate about research and risk management with a master's degree in forensic accounting. He is also a CPA fellow, chartered and certified accountant, um, certified internal auditor, and fraud examiner. Huh. <coughs> What might have been Hi, Mustafa. And he's joining us live from Canada, Toronto, to be precise. Actually. Now, Mustafa, so I've said this thing that if I, by chance, <laughs> I wake up one morning and my account is, is empty, missing. I am coming to you. Um, so, I mean, we've been having a lot of issues around um, cybersecurity, especially here in Nigeria. And I'll say why I say so, because now... I mean, if you use certain bank apps, you would notice that a lot of banks have been having a lot of issues mm -hmm. with... I mean, one of the banks that I have, the app was not just working. Mm -hmm. It was asking me to relog details. It would send me a code for three days. I couldn't go into my bank. I was literally scared. And yesterday, I was expecting a payment from a client, and the client said that he couldn't do the transfer because mm -hmm. the same bank... You know, that he's, that he's even scared. I hope his money is safe. I said, okay, even Ito was scared that my, I thought my money was gone. But I went to the bank and there's, the money is there and all of that. But, and I feel like strongly that this is strongly tied to a lot of brain drain that is happening in, um, is our, in our tech space, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you really want to speak holistically, like assessing our risk, you know, to fraudulent activities, you know, right now, what do you think our risk exposure rather is right now? Because again, we really don't have so much expertise when it comes to protecting, you know, ourselves, you know, um, especially in the digital space. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you very much for the introduction. Um, basically, you're correct. Um, um, the cyberspace um, for 
past couple of years, we've had where Nigeria and Nigerians within Nigeria and outside Nigeria are interacting with the digital world where everything takes place on the internet. So when we say cyber, it's a synonym or is another word for using the internet itself or uh, everything that occurs on the internet. So what we have today in the digital space now is a lot of us have uh, mobile phones. We have devices, we have gadgets that can actually um, go into the internet and conduct transactions, um, send emails, exchange information basically. And what that has done is we are having interactions that should have taken place physically, taking place on the digital space. So when you say cyber fraud, it's basically the same fraud that actually occurs within you and I, if we know each other or if we know each other uh, physically, it's taking place on a digital space. And what has happened is what's uh, traditionally, traditionally occurred within individuals where there was an act of deception is also taking place online. So it's just the, the platform is different, but the methods remain the same. So everyone is trying to gain advantage of your information. Everyone is trying to um, take undue advantage, basically, based on what they know and what they don't know. So sometimes they keep trying, like you, you mentioned earlier, you get some emails, you get some text messages, you get that, that, what, that's what the public call attacks. And what is expected, basically, is wherever your data, your information is stored, there should be some framework or architecture for that information to be secure, to be guarded, and to be protected. Now, what usually causes, when I say some concern, is the fact that when uh, maybe, let's say, your money is missing, or maybe there is a transaction that is hooked somewhere and stuff like that, we most times, and this is actually correct, we tend to blame the institution that owns the data or that owns the, let's say, um, application or the portal or internet and stuff like that. However, in as much as the responsibility has to do with the provider, the service provider or the infrastructure, the users themselves, they actually hold it upon themselves to educate themselves on how to use these devices. So the first form of protection actually comes from the individuals using this. And I don't want to sound very technical. I'll just assume there were days when we never used to have um, um, any of these devices. And people used to write um, check books, which is really reducing about, that was the very most, uh, most common ways of, um, let's say, withdrawing money and transferring money. There was still fraud there. Now we have where it's going through the internet and you are transferring money and there's the network and there's some infrastructure issues or maybe there's some denial of service and stuff like that. And we are somehow blaming, let's say, the system. I'm not going to give the system a pass back, but I would say they've also tried their best based on, if you look at the complex nature of the country itself, the population and the environment, the external environment itself, it's kind of contributes to why people do what they do. So fraud is something that is very global, is universal, it takes place everywhere. I will tell you, even as much as you mentioned something that you said, oh, um, Nigeria has a lot of incidences, I can also simply tell you that it's not just Nigeria, alone, it's everywhere. However, one of the soft currencies that makes societies function is actually trust. So if you go to the other spaces or you go to different countries, it's not like they don't have people who try to steal or try to take advantage of your information. But what they do is like there's a there is this social currency being up between everyone, and it's just the fact that everything we do is based on trust. And whenever someone comes to try to break that trust, there is a punishment for each one of these. For Nigeria, we actually have laws. And I think I, I listen to lawyers to laws, and they usually say this. It's not like Nigeria doesn't have a lot of laws. I think one of the things there is that. Implementation is usually our major problem. So for the cyberspace, we have a cybersecurity law. When the president um, recently, uh, the new president actually, that one of the, um, um, the laws he signed, um, the bills he signed was the data protection bill. And that basically gives like provisions about protecting your data and the companies that are actually managing them. So we actually have laws, cyberbullying, cyber stalking, um, child pornography, and different materials that you see, you see, you see the, the crime being committed on the internet and with institutions. But I think where the, let's like say the gap is, is the fact that the, the control measures are not being implemented. So that's where I can agree with you to say that. So I'm not gonna um, really just say, um, oh, the country itself, yes, there's a there's a factor of, let's say the brain drain contributing to this, and that's um, builds on the institution to have a security framework that is well-funded 
and is um, just is secure enough for it to protect the customers' um, data and their transactions. However, when I also consider the fact that the number of transactions we have, our uh, population and our interaction, it, um, yeah, I also want to give credit to the fact that it's actually not easy managing the numerous um, kind of um, dynamics we have in Nigeria. So that being said, I would just say um, the connection between the individuals themselves, the institutions, and the law itself, or the agencies that are meant to protect you, is actually what makes up for the cyber security framework. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to speak too much grammar about the Internet of Things, all of these IT things, but I will say be behind any of these um, devices that you mentioned or any of these buzzwords you're hearing, there are human beings, like human beings are actually the ones behind all of this. So we have to understand the way human beings function, and that's the major part about fraud itself, the psychology of fraud, because that's the that's that's the reason why you have certain um, was the motivations behind certain incidences of crime. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> okay, um, thank you, Mustafa. I you said you talked about funds and how cybersecurity can be pretty expensive and all of that. So now let me now bring it down to small businesses in Nigeria, right? So we know that cybersecurity can be expensive for small businesses. So are there any? Um, cost-effective strategies that can actually help to strengthen the posture of cybersecurity for small businesses. Okay, so I'll say the first one, like I said again, like breaking this down into looking at the way this will actually occur off the digital space and the way it translates on the cyberspace. So it's for small businesses to first understand like, okay, what's the interaction between yourself as a business product or service provider and your customers or whoever you're working with. So that would be the institutions and um, regulators or other competitors or clients. Mm -hmm. Then you have to say, you draw up a framework and say, okay, what are the um, um, gaps or what are the, uh, what, okay, what are the information that we actually require from each of these um, um, variables or each of these um, bodies? Then see how does it translate itself to the cyber world itself? So for instance, um, someone who has a shop in Idumata, for instance, and what she does or what he does is to like um, uh, what's called record um, transactions that have come in from each customer. Very simple thing you can always do is, yes, typically you have a book where you record all of these transactions. You get the customer's details, which let's say is their name, their bank information, and the amounts they paid, and you try to keep that information. So simple, cost-effective ways of doing that is, first of all, you are trying to keep that information online. Now. The beauty of the internet and the and technology developments we have today is we actually have devices, we have um, solutions that you can actually pay for that could actually take that stress off you. So, but the most important thing, like I said earlier, is the fact that you as the provider, as the individual holding that information should actually know your responsibility towards the information you are holding. Mm -hmm. So the first step of protect and uh, the first step towards protection starts with the business itself and seeing that we have this information about ourselves or our customers and we have a duty to protect it. We have a duty to protect the transactions that occur between each one of us and we have a duty um, to store it in a place that is secure. And you could always consult or you could always, you could always see some of this, um, I don't want to mention any names anyway, but you can see some of this in some of the um, service providers we use and they have like, um, what's it called? They have um, certain packages for us, which sometimes some of them are actually free, but they have like a limitation. So you can always start small and upload or secure your information up there. So if I give you a simple example, I say let's say you're backing up your information on the cloud, and you are not keeping the let's you, you, your password, for instance, is shared with like four, five, six, seven people, and those people actually have nothing to do with your company or your business, your small business. For goodness' sake, you can't blame the service provider that is giving you that security. You actually blame yourself because the first thing, like I said, has to do with your consciousness towards understanding what your role is in the system itself. Yes, there's a lot of expectation of what um, others should do to you, but for, from your place, you should first of all understand what you need to do to protect yourself and those you interact with. So that's where sometimes we use this extension of the words like confidentiality, privacy and um, some other words like that. The first data, you go to some um, organizations, they leave their data everywhere. They have a um, musical, they have some things that they share that everyone can access. So their consciousness of their security level towards 
information security is kind of low. And sometimes they are doing it out of ignorance because they don't know better. They sometimes have no idea that this could actually be a risk to the business they are doing. And beyond that, the fact that when some of these incidences occur, everyone starts to trace where it actually started from. Mm. So that's when you start saying that, oh, maybe it was someone that actually left this information in a party or a table, or they left their phone unlocked, mm -hmm. or they left their laptop somewhere, or they took their laptop to a repair, um, repair shop, and the repair person, they actually took everything, every information they had, they packed it up, and the information was exposed. So it's understanding how the likes of the biggest currency, the currency, the biggest currency being information, is protected, is shared, and how it can become a source of risk to every organization. Okay. Um, you know what? Let's quickly run off on a break. When we come back from that break, uh, I have a few questions. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I thank you for staying with us. Now, if you just tuned in, we're discussing uh, fraud prevention and protection in the digital sp uh, society. And we have with us Mustafa Yusuf Adebola. Now, please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 You can also tweet us at Wayshow, Akko, one with the hashtag Wayshow. So, Mustafa, in the conversation around protection, I'd be prevention, right? What information is too much information. I don't know if you understand what I mean. Um, sometimes we carelessly just give out info, because I know a lot of people like in the US, you protect your social security number mm -hmm. and all of that. We don't have those kind of things yeah. here. We have NIN, yeah, BVN. we have BVN and all of that. So what information is too much information? Um, so like what are the most sensitive informations to like uh, keep? Uh, I'll say this because, for instance, I noticed in my bank that for every, for every transaction that I did on my app, right, I get a fake alert email. Yeah. It, I think it still happened, but at some point I had to block. I don't know what's happening. I was blocking and blocking. I didn't even bother to report to the bank because mm -hmm. it's not my account. So, so for instance, if I did a debit of 10,000 naira, for mm -hmm. instance, mm -hmm. I would get an email that showed that I got a credit of, of 1,000 naira or 2,000 naira. I didn't do that transaction. Wow. But I always used to get a, um, what's it called, an email mm -hmm. when that happened. And again, the email, I don't remember giving the bank that email. Do you understand? Yeah. So I, I didn't remember giving the bank that email. So that's why it didn't really bother me. But now, sometimes, looking back again, is it that somebody is, like, shadowing my account? Or is there something happening that I'm not aware of, you know? you know? But again, I check account balance. Everything is okay, so I don't really bother myself. So now, I don't know. Is it possible I must have given that information somewhere? I don't know. So what, what exactly are, like, very, very quick access? If, 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 if a fraudulent person wants to access your account, what is too much information? Thank you for that question. So, um... What I would just summarize that as is um, personally identifiable information, which is kind of tricky because, for instance, you mentioned my name, I know your name, but these are information, or this is information that is actually used in terms of you signing up for certain um, privileges. So, your NIN, when you were registering for it, you had your name, your date of birth, you had your address, you had some information that we could track and say, this is this person. When you were doing your BVN as well, your KYC and some of those similar um, um, elements you have with the bank or the financial institutions, they also ask you for some personally identifiable information. So you keep on seeing a pattern where even when you're doing your passports, let's say pick up or you are updating of the information, you get the same data, your name, your address, your date of birth, your nest of kin, your mother's maiden name, and some identifiable information that we know that is only most likely unique to you. One additional step they do is to get your um, fingerprints if they can. So, whether you like it or not, you need to share some of this information. But you actually have to ask yourself who you have to share this information with or to, and why it is necessary. So, when you mention the social insurance number or security number that is used in some other countries, which Nigeria also uses by with the NIN, is why should that number be shared with um, a private business, for instance? And if it's supposed to be shared with a private business, what's the purpose? Like, are they by law meant to get that information from you? So what the first star does is, the first star doesn't just, there, there are two methods. So the first star, first of all, there are some that they try their luck. And what they do is, I don't know you, but I have your phone number. I have 
the phone number of, um, let's say, 200 guests that are going for a party tomorrow at Becky. And I'm aware of the details that, let's say, this person is getting married to this person and it's a child of social and so. I've, I, what I'm doing is I'm sourcing information, I'm observing, I'm gaining information. I have no idea about what you do because I go on the internet and I search about this person. Oh, I see on Instagram or I see on Facebook, this person has posted, oh, going binging, okay. So I'm edit, trying to identify and familiarize myself with that environment. So after I do that, what I do is I probably get a device that can actually send work messages to 200 of the guests. Now, imagine that 200 people are different places, different, they are thinking about differences, there are different um, moments, and they, go, they get an information and saying, oh, uh, Mustafa needs 5,000 air. It's urgent, I'll pay, get, I'll pay you back at the uh, venue of the event. Out of these 200 people, most likely, at least, probably one person is going to be respond to I've tried my luck. So that's something that's like I eat and miss. And I always say that that's actually what cost to every one of us, even the people that are probably like more uh, knowledgeable about fraud, security, and stuff like that. Because usually what happens with fraud is it catches you sometimes at the moments when you don't expect. So your intuition sometimes probably reminds us, and maybe that's it. So we can always use to like, oh, is this thing really okay? Maybe I should just sit back and think about it again. It might sound urgent, which is also another tactic, but just relax and, okay, let me call, or let me double check from someone or cross check us with someone else. Now, the second part is familiarization. So you have followers, you have viewers, you share on your status, you share on your internet, and the truth there is we are all avatars. So in as much as you're seeing profile icons and you're having this um, stuff on the internet, we actually don't know who is behind it. So even if I'm your friend online, it's very possible that someone else is using my laptop today, for instance, and is using the privilege of my access to your to your network and, and viewing what information you have. So I may not have any bad intentions towards you, but someone else could actually have that intention towards you. So what they do is they look for every information you ha uh, they have about you, they piece it up together and try to make sense of it and see if you can be defrauded. Sometimes, and this is some, some, something we call identity theft, where we try to steal your identity, we try to mimic you. And it, it's, in fact, it's becoming very dangerous now with AI, but I don't want to go in there right now, but where we try to, we study you, the first time actually takes time before the heart. They try to look at what you will do in that circumstance and they try to pretend like you. And um, with what's going on now, I think oversharing the goal, I would say, is like I said earlier, any information that can be personally, personally identified to you. I can always say, if it's not really necessary at that point in time, and you don't want everybody to know about it, I'll probably advise not to no, share. No, but, uh, but Mustafa, <laughs> let us go there. You say you don't want to go there. You have to go there. AI. Because Iblai said the biggest fraudulent <laughs> people are these people that have created all these smartphones and all these things. You will just, like, I will literally have a conversation. Mm -hmm. With you now that I just want to go and wax my eyebrow. And the next all thing, you're on, I did not. I was not on the app. Oh. Mm -hmm. Jonas, I was not on the app. Nothing, right? So, because the reason I'm saying this is that if they can hear it, mm -hmm. it means that the front line people took out. So hear me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like literally, like we don't have our privacy anymore. Everything you talk about right now, right? If I just go on any social media platform, the next thing I'm seeing sponsored ads. On that thing, like after every post, another sponsored, and after like it's just going to be back mm -hmm. to back. So I mean, we 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 are actually very very exposed, you know. So how do we begin to start to protect ourselves, right? If we say, okay, yes, these things, information is out there, you know. Some of us that went to vote, our voters card, it has our NIN. You know, somebody is traveling, you put your international passport on all the whatever. It has all those documents, you know. I stop putting location wherever I, whenever I'm posting on Instagram. But I'm saying to you that these things are like out there, and sometimes I even feel like we're being monitored with our smartphones, right? So how do we begin to protect ourselves? What would a good prevention uh, structure or strategy look like for anybody that is um, conscious of uh, what's it called protection? Okay, so like I said, the first responsibility starts with the user, and the user should acknowledge the fact that you are using a device, you are using a platform, you are interacting with the other world. What's your responsibility towards yourself, 
towards the others. So if you want to protect yourself, you look out for yourself first, like when you're on the flight, they tell you to first put your um, safety jacket first before taking care of someone else. So in that, um, we are using, using that view, I would say you need to understand the platforms and the T's and C's, the terms and conditions of these platforms before using all of them. Um, except information is necessary to be shared, I would advise you, would I say delay? So what some people do these days now is they, they share the information after the fact. Now, why I mentioned the fact that the user actually has to be responsible is your comments just now reminded me of, even during the elections, I noticed when I was observing and people sharing, like you said, um, they are sharing voters card, they are sharing, in fact, what really scares me or what really makes, makes me worry is if you look at the past when media reports, the newspapers and um, television reports, they used to, they used to, probably because they were skilled on this, they, they knew certain information that should not be shared with the public because of the implication. However, now with everyone becoming a user of every platform, it's not everyone who actually understands the implication of what they are doing. So even if you don't share this, what happens is people start to dig up information about you. And that's where I mentioned something, I was, I was going back to the question of um, what businesses can do. They take information from different sources and start to share to the world. Now, in that instance, you have no control over that because someone else is doing that. However, you can resort to the law. The second part is, I'll go with two, um, two um, streams here. And the first one being that the, there are different generations right now. There's the older generation, the certain generation, and there is the, I think it's the alpha generation now. And the alpha generation right now is at most risk because parents who give birth, in fact, before the, a child, and generation alpha, I think it's from 2015 or so, I'm not so sure about the dates, but this generation, and the parents are actually comfortable with social media. And before the baby is born, when the baby is born, after the baby is born, they are already giving a digital footprint about this child. And the longer term effect of this has not really come up, but there is already studies to show that you are putting that child at risk because everyone actually has a timeline about how they grew up, who they were, their identity, and they've studied, they've studied them and it's part uh, is uh, like on uh, the web for someone to actually go back to. Recently, regarding AI, there was in Canada, yeah, there was a news report about a, a, I think it was a teenager that was kidnapped and the kidnappers, what they used was AI. So they pretended like the lady was in, was being captured. So her voice was, it was basically a fake voice. Me and the mother was scared and it was already like um, sourcing for funds to pay the people who kidnapped her uh, daughter not realizing that her child was actually safe somewhere else. So when her child appeared, she was like, she was confused because what she knew was like that voice was actually her child pleading that mom, can you help me with these captors or with this kind of, these people have, have caught me. So basically what we are saying is we need to be very circumspect about what we even share about our friends. So, so it's not just about us because sometimes, like I said, um, why you might probably just be um, having that form of security whatever they have about you cannot be within your control. So mm. you should like have that um, responsibility towards their information. You should ask yourself the questions about this uh, information I'm sharing, can it put this other person at, in danger? Can you put them at risk? Who am I sharing it with? So maybe sometimes you just want to share with a close circle. But like I said, these days, anything that goes out there, just assume that it's already there because now we have screenshots, even when there are see a size that prevents you from taking screenshots, what some people do, they take videos. So everyone is trying to like, everyone is like oversharing and maybe it's like the dopamine effects of the social media. So I would just advise that you take a second look and even the information you have out there, try to scrape it up if you see that maybe it's something that you don't want to be there anymore. You speak to the web um, admin of such websites or contact some other web administrators to like help you to remove this information because there's some forms that actually allow you to be able to request for certain information not to be shared. So you may have done it in the past and now you are thinking about it and you're like, do I really need this information? Do I want people to really know about this? If you want to remove it, you can always contact those uh, who have published mm. such information about you. Okay. But I can I'll just say, try to limit the personal information about you that is out there. Try as much as possible to limit mm. that. Okay. So in other words, just reduce your digital footprints. 
Mm. Okay. Um, not to sound too technical, but I was also going to talk about, I would rather ask about um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, and Kobo. I think blockchain particularly, because I've read in several places um, where they've mentioned that blockchain actually has very strong security features. So is, is there by any chance, or rather, is there any chance that blockchain can actually help in um, fraud prevention? Yeah, so like mm -hmm. it, you mentioned, so there's a security architecture for all of these platforms, even the web itself, what's a security, um, what's it called? security platform. Um, the degree to the extent to which the users are sophisticated on each platform is the degree to which you would get, well, let's say, attacks. So that comes in two ways. So if you're using blockchain and you say you have um, a security that's uh, mature or let's say strong, you also have those who are knowledgeable enough to use such platforms. So what does that mean? That means such people are let's say, brilliant enough to take advantage of the, let's say, the system itself. So irrespective of the platform itself, even if it's the, like I said, I always go off digital and just say, let's assume that everything we are doing is paperwork. What's the security measures we actually have there? And when you start from there, you start to imagine how this, well, let's say basics, have transferred to the online space, the digital space, and seeing how the architecture behind it, how does it interact with you? What's 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 the form of communication between yourself and each of these, what I say, platforms? So if it's blockchain, if it's cyber, whatever it is, you actually have to look at the end-to-end -end process and see that, okay, this device or this model, this platform I'm using, who owns the data? Who owns the information? If something goes wrong, who can I contact? Is there a law behind it? Can, because that's where you have to start taking things very seriously so that you can know how, if something goes wrong, how can you actually seek, um, what's it called, seek justice from the legal framework? Mm. I was going to say that there is a really high rise of fraud in Nigeria, especially, especially amongst young people. Mm. Uh, young people are going into this, um, what's it called, cyber fraud, you know, I want to blow Yahoo, <laughs> you know, and it, it's really bad. Honestly speaking, like it's literally really bad. You you are hoping and praying that you know some people would just you know look away from that thing, but I think it's very lucrative. So mm. I want to ask you, um, Mustafa, really, how easy is it for fraudsters to make money? Because it seems like that is the new um, job job uh, market for mm. them harvesting young people, right? Is it is it as easy as they make it seem? You know, they would it's they would blow and they would buy <laughs> bears. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of videos on social media. In fact, some have even sang songs about it. You know, like it's. It, I think it's just in a, a walk in a park. But as it be like this, so you know, it's, it look it looking like a career that somebody can go and try. <laughs> May have made myself go blow, but but I want to believe that these things are not are not particularly easy. I mean, there's a video that I love that video, that audio sound. A lot of people have used it on TikTok. Where if a, a, a fraudster called her, said, "Give me that there was a code that just came to your number." She said, zero, 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 zero. That one, eh? The guy said, "You are a, you are a, you are a bastard. You are a fool." She said, "She kept on, okay, okay. Let me tell you the last one. Four, four. You know, so she knew that she was talking." To a fraudster, yeah, right? Yeah. So, I mean, like, literally, how easy is it? Because I know fraud, fraud from, I can smell it from afar. So, boy, for them to still be really, really in existence, it means that, I mean, is it that they are upping their game or we are just very ignorant? So, how easy is it for these guys, you know, to make money? So, it's just like asking it, see if how is it easy for him to, like, have a successful, would I say, um, attack or robbery or something like that. You always keep trying your luck to you eat it. So, and we have like think over eight billion people in the world. So, there is a lot of what I say data sets to play with. So, and as we continue to exist, whether we like it or admit it or not, we're always gonna fraud has actually always existed even before we came into this world. Mm. Like I just said, what has actually happened now is that the dynamics has changed, and because now we have a now it's, it that, has moved on to so uh, to the cloud the mm -hmm. the fraud unlike the physical one mm. touch and follow exactly. so, <laughs> so, so sometimes they take advantage of the old or the elderly because if some of them or most of them are not interested in using technology mm -hmm. and some of them are like I'm, not, I'm never going to use this but sometimes or some some way they still find a way to make them commit and the old person is like how could i be so 
how could I, how could I become so low to do this? But basically, like I said, they are taking advantage of what's going on. So usually we have something we call the four triangle, which basically that model like tries to summarize um, the motives behind fraud and uh, all the elements of fraud itself. And one of it is um, treasure. The second is opportunity. The third is rationalization. Um, pressure basically is what motivates you to do what you're doing. And I have to admit, because the unemployment statistics are actually out there, so you have quite a number of people that are being under pressure that you must give us something. I can see your mate. Your mate is giving us this and that. So there's a societal pressure. And like I said, you can't really, you can't blame anyone for that. You have to actually ask yourself, what's the society itself defining as its moral conduct? Because like I said, I mentioned something about trust itself. Like, there are some elements in the past before you probably leave some items out and people will not touch it but these days you can't try it and the second part is like you're saying when you mentioned the artist saying something about that there's actually a u.s artist that also released a, a song and it was actually i think it's called wire something basically about fraud tutorial which is very interesting and it was teaching people how to actually commit electronic fraud e fraud so sometimes and this is part of what we are saying what's the society itself talking about what's the culture because whether you like to admit it or not, the songs, the catchphrases that we are hearing actually reflect what the morals of society itself is. So if we are like um, glamorizing, so there's got so much glamour on some of these. Mm -hmm. um, it means we are kind of like okay with it. Yeah. Because in, I'm, I'm not sure. We're, you we're endorsing mm -hmm. fraud. Yeah. But you I'm not speaking up. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you comment quickly. Yeah. Okay, good evening, my dear beautiful sisters of what are you saying? Um, fraud pre prevention and protection of digital society. When it comes to fraud prevention, we need to tackle the matter carefully. Your guest made mention of understanding someone before knowing, before knowing how to deal with the person, and I agree wholeheartedly. Another thing is we need to inquire about giving out information so that we do not give out too much information. Over familiarity is another thing that leads to fraud. What is that woman doing with bot enlargement? Just like that, she cut her life short, doing something that is not necessary. Sister Wa, thank you. Sister Wa, thank you. My dear beautiful sister Chinelo for a job well done. Thank you very much, Daniel. I'm covering the show yesterday. I missed you yesterday, sister Uwa. My name is no, Daniel so, Iwo Reyes. Even me, content. I don't miss myself. <laughs> <laughs> you, you miss me more. Thank you, Daniel. But I mean, uh, Mustafa, in wrapping this up in a minute, right, uh, what would you say to government pol... No, not go you've, you've spoken about government policies, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we start to implement some of these policies that we already have on ground? Is this something... Or, or really, is fraud, fraud uh, prevention just solely on... I think it's just solely on what's it called information dissemination. So let me channel it to the um, national. What's the word now? The um, the one orientation agency, yes, yes, right? Yes. How, how do you think they can help? Yeah, well, that's a government agency that's mandated to like spread awareness of different um, of or well, spread awareness among them by citizens of the country. Um, we actually have, even for consumers, so there's consumer fraud right, that actually occurs between you and some, let's say, organizations, or let's say you bought something and it's fake and stuff like that. So they actually have channels that you can actually um, contact them and you express yourself. Where the problem is, is how do they respond? So when you're talking about your bank and incidences, actually CBN itself also says, first of all, try to resolve it within the bank. And if the bank doesn't resolve this, um, they have an email, they have some contact numbers for you to do it. I personally do this. So I always test the system and make sure that, okay, if it's not working, then I try to escalate. it. So because it's me try, like, trying to find and um, seek out justice. The second I will say, I'm told, well, the second I will say, I think beyond the NOA itself, because I, I've heard a lot of people saying the NOA, they are trying to make sure it lives up to its task, is the media itself. So what we are sharing and what we remind people about, the consciousness of people are uh, being um, like there's there's something that's in their mind whenever you talk. So uh, there's a podcast that I listen to that's always saying, "Oh, I'll never do anything that's going to spoil my father's name." And this podcaster is about sixty something years old, and that's what he ends his show with every 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 day. So there are some little things that we share that people are looking up. They are young and they are like, "Okay, I'm trying to do." They're looking up to you as a presenter and like, "Okay, maybe the information they are passing can make them." It can validate their concerns or you condemn it. So don't take whatever you're doing for granted. The media actually has a very powerful Absolutely. Role. And that's why we'll continue to keep up with this conversation 
on fraud prevention, protection, and we'll bring in a lot more angles to this. Thank you so much, Mustafa, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Chinelo. Yeah. Now, before we go, ensure you follow us. Don't fall victim. Oh. <laughs> follow us across all our social media platforms at Waste Your Africa. You can also try to find Mustafa on the... Um, uh, what's it called, on his social media handles mm -hmm. as well. Um, it's very important to get as much information as you can. Remember to like, share, and invite your families and friends to watch and follow the conversation. Um, if you're looking for his handle, check our page. You will see his handle there. Now, if you missed our quote for today, here it is again. We are giving away too much biometric data. If a bad guy wants your biometric data, remember this. He doesn't need your actual fingerprint. Just the data that represents your fingerprint that will be unique one of a kind. Try. See you guys on Monday <laughs> at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Ciao.